Hi, Ross. Wonderful that this is coming together, this call. Um, you've, your work has been so important in my life. I've worked in the same movements and I worked for companies that you helped to bring into being. Um, and I lived in an eco village that uh, gained a lot from the global eco village network connections that, that you made possible. So this is just wonderful to, to have an opportunity to have this conversation with you. Um, well, welcome on, on the Voices of the Regeneration. Oh, thank you for having me. It's good to be here. <laughs> so, Ross, <clears throat> I mean, we, I was just thinking we've known each other. Well, I've known of you since for at least 20 years, but I think we met the first time in 2005 at a conference in, in Findhorn when the um, Guy Education curriculum was launched. Actually, I think we first met in, in um, uh, Dartington uh, mm -hmm. when you were, you were at Shoemaker. Ah, okay. We, did you visit Schumacher while I was? So yeah, that yeah, was I met you there. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. So, <laughs> so Ross, you, your journey has just been remarkable. I mean, you're originally Canadian, but you lived most of your life in, in, in Denmark. Um, right, right. How did you come from being an operations research PhD um, working, was it with IBM or so, something in the beginning to, to starting, helping to start the Global Eco Village Network? Well, what, I was with IBM for a couple of years and then I started up a, a consulting company with um, a, an American partner who, we had, we, who had studied with me in the US in the same background, yeah. So I worked for a number of years as a, here in Denmark as a, uh, consultant in introducing uh, the use of computers at a bit more advanced level for a lot of businesses, you know, using optimization technologies and that sort of thing. Um, so it's it really exciting those first 10 years. Every, there were no standard models then. Everything had to be created from scratch, you know. So it was quite a different from being a consultant today. <laughs> yeah. And, and was it, I mean, I have a sort of vague memory that some of the work you were doing was also involved with setting up the European system of automatic cash tellers and, and, and all that did? No, no. I think what you're thinking of is yeah. I developed one of the first so-called cash management uh, models mm -hmm. here with the largest Danish bank <clears throat> at the time mm -hmm. in around 1966, 67. Oh, wow. Um, you had optimization of their cash management and sort of that sort of thing. It was one of the first bank models we did. And then I, I, <clears throat> I founded uh, Simcorp, which is now a, a, a leading European software company uh, in 1970. Mm -hmm. um, and it was built very much upon some of those ideas about <clears throat> bank models and, uh, and, and, and financial applications. So it's become a pretty big company. I, I sold it off, unfortunately, very too early. <laughs> mm. and, and how, when did, the, when did you meet Hildo in all of that and move to Den Denmark? And because you, were you still in that world when you were, starting the co-housing um, efforts? Well, I, met, I met Hildur about four months after <clears throat> I arrived in Denmark in 1964, while I was with uh, IBM. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was the reason that I stayed on in Denmark afterwards. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, and so, so tell me a bit more about that, like, because it must have been a little bit like living in two worlds for a while, no? Um, working with the financial industry and, and banks, but also helping to start grassroots activity around co-housing and, and then later eco-villages because they, I mean even I never understood that the, the bit from being in the co-housing movement and then you were already strategically thinking about connecting these villages when you got Robert and Diane Gilman to travel around the world to to write this report to Gaia Trust about eco-villages but had you? What was your first connection with the eco village movement? How did, how did you? Yeah, well, actually, I met Diane and Robert much many twenty years later, but uh, in around nine, early nineteen seventies, uh, <clears throat> um, Hildu and I, and together with the four other couples, founded one of the first co housings in, here in Denmark, um, and we felt that it was the best way to bring up children. And we none of us we weren't quite satisfied with the other options which were available, particularly for for women. You know, then they had the choice of having a career and putting the kids into a daycare, or staying at home and giving up their career to take care of the kids. And and uh, uh, 
my wife Hildur, she was opposed to both those solutions. And so we came up with this idea with some other friends of having this, this co-housing concept where we could each have our own individual home, but at the same time, um, have a community and, and share a lot of things, among other things, sharing, uh, taking care of the kids, you know, so they had several different parents, basically. And that was the beginning of the co-housing movement, uh, which later spread around the world. Um, and uh, it was first somewhat later that I, um, I met Diane and Robert <clears throat> started thinking about expanding the vision. The co-housing movement was basically a social movement. Mm -hmm. You know, there wasn't any, there was no, nobody talked much about sustainability in 1970. Mm -hmm. And, and um, the spiritual aspect also was very rare. Uh, although there were certain places like um, Orville and uh, Findhorn, Solheimer, perhaps in Iceland, and a couple of others that were more spiritually oriented, but mostly it was a social movement in the early days. Yeah, so I, was, yeah. I always remember that from, from Findhorn, even from the, the, the days that I contacted with Findhorn, um, around 2000. I would arrive and ask, like I arrived because I was interested in eco-villages. And, and then I found out that Finton had this whole history as a spiritual community founded primarily for that purpose. And that even in 2000, there was still a little bit of, a, like I would say about half of the community was more, I'm in Finton because it's a spiritual community. And if you want to talk about eco-villages, talk to me or to John Talbot or to Craig, but don't talk to me. And and it took like when by the time I moved there, I think that was already changing in 2007. And by the time I left, um, the narrative of eco village and like ecology and spirituality being two two entry doors to to the same space of interfering yes, yes. um, was fully accepted. Uh, yeah. Well, there were <clears throat> there were roughly three different motives for forming an eco village. One is the, the, the social, that was probably the, the original one and still probably the most important for co-housing at least. Then there, then there is the spiritual aspect, which is uh, uh, the much many fewer cases, but in some cases that is the inspiration, like at Fintorn in Oroville mm -hmm. and Damon Hoor in Italy. Uh, and then there's the um, uh, ecological aspect. Uh, some places are inspired by that. For example, Crystal Waters in Australia, Earth Haven in the US and a few others. And so um, the starting point is often different, but what, what, what we often see in practice is that gradually people integrate the other two aspects as they grow. And so the, the, I think some of the very best eco-villages are those which have been able to integrate all of those aspects into their, into their communities. What, one thing that I, that, because you mentioned Crystal Waters, it, Crystal Waters for me is an interesting case because it's more of a developer-led eco-village. Like it, it, it actually was more of a sort of, let's develop an eco-village and get people involved, but here's a plan yeah. and people buy into a set of basic rules and then co-create the most detailed social yeah. rules. And, and that's very different from something organically growing out of a few people moving in a caravan to a, um, a Ab caravan absolutely. park. A absolutely, yeah, but the thing about eco villages is they're so different, they're so diverse. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't have a standardized model. I mean, mm -hmm. you have like examples like developer, uh, developed eco villages like Crystal Waters, spiritual like Findhorn, and, 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 and mostly the social ones. So they're so diverse. But the thing that is, I think really, unites them around and i've traveled a lot around the world as you have also in many countries and um no matter what country you i visited no, what, no matter what the color of their skin or their religion their culture what we have in common is a value system we have a common set of values which is as much to do with taking care of each other and taking care of the planet as as you know the important things in life and um, that, that 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 is a universal uh, all over the eco village movement mm -hmm. that's what keeps it together and how do you see it? Because I mean, it's it's just remarkable for those people who don't know you so well. Um, because you, you you're eighty something now. Eighty. How old are you now? Eighty three. Eighty three, and you're so still tuned into everything that's going on out there. Oh, yeah. Um, you've seen this big arc from having been involved in one of the first experiments around co-housing then 
the kind of coming together of the global ecovillage network and the trying to find the pattern that, that is in common somehow with ecovillages. Um, but right now, and I think you, you're also involved in this, there's another, like since COVID, I feel the younger generation is talking about, a, they call them whatever, regenerative villages or um, all, all sorts of new terms, but it's the, the, the same impulse of let's come together, get a piece of land with a like-minded group of people and um, try to create recreate community living that is aligned with planetary stewardship and custodianship of the place that we, we live in. But what I find difficult to, to observe, um, and I'm 50 now, uh, is that there's so little learning from the previous experiments. Like very often I talk to people that, that just aren't aware of all these different experiments within the global eco-village movement that have gone on, all the, the, the things that have been written up about the, the integrate complexity of forming and nurturing community. Um, how do you see this right now? Like seeing all these new rebuild or regen villages or whatever pop up and, and with very little awareness of lineage. Yeah, well, um, the evolution of the uh, eco-village movement has been to a great extent below the radar of the, uh, uh, the general population and particularly the politicians. Um, I think that a lot of damage perhaps was done back in the 1970s by some of the early examples of eco-villages, which gave the impression that there were a bunch of hippies, that they were, uh, uh, they were rejecting society and isolating themselves in the country. And this is just image continues at least until the year 2000 and even more than that. Um, but the reality is that the, that's, not, that's not the way it is. They, they represent maybe just one to 5% of the total of those hippies. And most of the people building Iglesia have actually have good jobs. They pay their taxes. They are very mainstream people in many ways, except they have these different values. You know, they, they're not just out just to earn a lot of money and to get a lot of power in society. They, they, their focus is on, on lifestyle and, um, as I say, taking care of them, each other and taking care of the planet. And I think that this is a, an attitude which is gradually, gradually beginning to seep into the mainstream. And, and that's why you see a lot of young people today who are gra grasping this as a way of uh, going forward where they're not satisfied with the, the, uh, the current lifestyle and that they're forced into. Um, and so I think we're gonna see a, a growing uh, movement in the future, although it has gone very slowly up to now for the last, well, we started it pretty much back in around 1990. Um, and at that time, our thinking was that the eco village movement was in a way a, a sub subversive movement because it was really trying to change the whole nature of society uh, by putting greater focus on, as I said, the, these values that I mentioned. And uh, to do that by, not by writing articles or going to conferences, but by making an examples, actually leading by example, building these communities actually on the ground. And the strategy was basically that if we we're able to successfully build such communities, then the, the, the idea will spread and we, they will be replicated. And that is, I think, the, the, the basic way that, that, that you learn is, is by seeing an example and then following. And that is what is happening now today because people are so dissatisfied with the, uh, the way our current system functions. It's basically dysfunctional these days because we have so much inequality and more and more people are dissatisfied with their lives and they're looking for alternatives. And, and, and more and more people are discovering this as uh, an important alternative. Mm. Yeah, but, the, I, but precisely because of that, what I'm still not, I mean, of course it's happening and I think Gaia Education and, and all the education programs that are run in eco villages have helped with providing some of the lessons learned to a wider audience that might not have gone out to set up an eco village, but to just transform their local community where they were living. Um, but I still feel that there is a little bit of this issue that, that the transfer, like right now, for example, I see a lot of people finding new and 
investment forms into community, um, working with very techy ideas of, of how to make the place sustainable in terms of more the ecological dimension, very much into centrific uh, agriculture and, and, and regenerative agriculture and agroforestry. All, all of the, so, so the, the economic dimension, the ecological dimension, even the worldview and the personal, the, like the spirituality dimension, I see, but the social dimension, I find that right now in these new attempts, isn't being given enough of an attention in ter- uh, the, like the social dimension isn't giving uh, enough attention in terms of being the foundation of how to actually work together. There's some people into sociocracy experimenting with that, but I, there's a certain blue-eyedness around how difficult it is actually is to um, make collective decisions once you go onto that path together. And, and that's where I, f- I feel the transfer isn't happening from the deep lessons and the tools and frameworks that, that are used in eco-villages that Guy Education presents in, in its courses um, into these these new experiments. Um, and, and you involved with one of those developer-led region activities in Denmark now? Yeah, uh, but let me just say, I, I don't quite have the same experience that, that you have regarding the mm-hmm. social. I still think that's the foundation for most yeah. villages. And, and it, it's all about um, community. And it's not always a success. I mean, there are many examples of eco-village projects which have failed. Mm-hmm. Um, and normally, if they do fail, it's, it's often because they have not been able to agree on a, a vision as to what, what does this particular group want to achieve. But uh, having a sort of a common house and eating together once in a while and having your own private home you can withdraw to and so forth. This is the, the, the standard characteristic, I think, in just about everywhere. Um, as you mentioned about develop, let, develop, developer-led projects, in fact, it is true that I am currently a partner in a, a Danish company of this type, which we, we call Bervo, which in Danish, it means uh, sustainable living, basically. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're just developing our first two projects right right now. Uh, to, they're both co-housing projects rather than eco-village projects, because that's, that's basically where the demand is right now. Um, and the idea here is that we will reduce the time from, from the, the concept to the actual moving into one to two years where the, the, many of the first eco villages it took eight to 10 years. And it was very difficult for people with no experience in how do you negotiate with communities and with farmers and how do you finance them and so forth. But by having professionals come in and do a lot of this kind of work for you, um, we, we were able to reduce the time and at the same time, keep the essence of the eco village by, we just don't build a bunch of houses and then sell them. We, part of our concept is that we talk to the people who want to move in in advance. We hold many, many meetings with them before they sign up. And so they actually know each other uh, by the time they move in. Mm-hmm. And that you way, we, we keep the original concept of the eco village alive. Mm-hmm. Because that's, I mean, I'd, I've lived this proxy while in the time that I was at Findhorn, a number of the smaller co housings on the periphery of the foundation were being developed, like Solishe. And, and I've seen it with a number of like friends who, who moved into co-housings that this pattern often is that, let's say if a group of 10 families gets together to start the co-housing or five, by the time the co-housing is ready, at least a third, if not 40% of them have dropped out. Yeah, exactly. And That's so typical. Yeah. Some, some people have carried a lot of the weight to actually keep yeah. keep the process going and then there are always some lucky ones who kind of come in relatively last minute with a little bit of the problem of having to say okay i agree with these concepts that you've co-developed and i'm i'm, I'm signing yeah, up yeah, yeah. but they but they are really the lucky ones in the sense that they, they haven't spent 10 years trying to yeah yeah that's it. Oh, no, nobody can wait around for 10 years i mean yeah. that, that that's why it's so important and another thing i might make mention that it's not just uh, my company now just at this roughly at the same time there are about three other companies in Denmark alone that have started up with the same idea. And that is because there's a tremendous demand. There's a tremendous demand. The EcoVillage network here is expanding with about 50% uh, a year right now. I mean, it's amazing. 
and uh, co-housing is even more. So the, the message has gotten through. And I understand from some of my contacts around Europe that the same phenomenon is happening elsewhere. So it's not just here. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm just looking for the, um, let me just find here, um, Maurits von Högewest, did he get in touch with you? Because he, he, he's got a company in um, the Netherlands called Building the New. And um, he's, he's, a, he's a relatively young guy who um, comes from a family that has been in, like a, his father has been a developer. And he learned the hard way how the old system is broken. And, and he's also developing, they're building the new, something very similar. Like they, yeah. they, they, they have a, already one site that they're exploring, which is called Commonwoods. And um, it's, it's not just the engagement with the future inhabitants, but to really smooth the thing, it's also an engagement of that group with the people in the wider area that the, that development sits in and also with the local um, developers. Yes. So, so to really weave the synergies before the people move in um, is basically needs, needs a lot of social facilitation and before you even start the hardware of building. Yeah. Well, these days, certainly in Denmark, there's a, there's a very close cooperation between the, the, the co-housing uh, projects and the, and the local municipality. Um, as opposed to the old days where they just did it on their own under the radar. T today, many municipalities in Denmark are actively seeking co-housing. And many of the so-called local plans that many communities have done are insisting upon when they, if they're going to develop an area that it should be, include some co-housing. Sometimes mm -hmm. it, specifically saying it must be that. And also an, another interesting development here in Denmark is that the, it's become standard now that you have to satisfy certain ecological standards yeah. of uh, the kind of materials that you're using and so forth. I mean, this is unheard of 10, 15 years ago. Today, yeah. you have to get, you have to, a, a golden standard that you have to develop to before you'll even get approved by the yeah. municipality. No, I mean, this, but I find, it, it's so fascinating when, like, to, to zoom out a bit and at the same time zoom in, um, with the strategic interventions that you have made possible through the funding you provided through Gaia Trust to a lot of organizations. Um, on, for most people, the, the most well-known organizations that have been born out of that were the, um, the Global Eco Village Network and Gaia Education, but you also invested strategically in a whole range of companies that had to do with one or the other on that mandala of the four dimensions um, yeah, that's right. That's right. Wind, wind energy or um, yeah. a local food system a healthier food yeah. system and yeah. and in so many areas what what you 20 25 30 years ago were strategically investing in as things that needed to be nourished Yes, yes. Let me tell you an interesting story about that background, because uh, we, when we started up Gaia Trust, we had a, our, our policy, first of all, was that we would only use the money we have earned ourselves. I, I earned a fair amount of money on behalf of Gaia Trust in the, in the 90s, working in, in the currency markets. And once we had that nest egg, we, we never sought money elsewhere. And so that made it very easy for us to say, OK, we're going to work for about 30 years while we're active. And, over that period of time, we'll use up our capital, but we won't spend it all. Um, we won't, we'll give grants every year to various mm -hmm. projects, but, but the main part of our capital, we, we thought we will invest this in uh, different kinds of projects or companies which would supplement what our, our grant making activities. Mm -hmm. This is what later became, became to be known as impact investment. But we started doing this 30 years ago. And I remember I went to one of the meetings in the United States. It was actually at Bretton Woods. Uh, 50 years is enough. I think that what they were calling it then in, in 1995. And um, I introduced this concept to the American uh, foundations, which were doing uh, grant making for environmental uh, projects. Like Rudolf Steiner Foundation and those. those we were called the Environmental Grant Makers Association. Mm -hmm. and, that they had never, none of them had thought of that. I said to them, look, how is it you have your grant making activities in one city, maybe in New York and, you, and, and your, um, your investment strategies are in Los Angeles. I said, why don't you use some of that enormous capital that you have in your pension funds and so forth, in your foundations to support your grant making activities? 
And this was a totally foreign concept at that time, but today it's become standard for, for them. People realize that they should be coordinating where they're making their investments and where they're making their grant making. Mm -hmm. But that we, we were pioneers in that area and we, we, we supported a number of startups in Denmark. One was a, uh, a small windmill company which still exists today called Gaia Wind. One was a organic food company called uh, Hanagale, which still exists. Uh, one of the, the other one was called um, uh, Gaia Solar, which was working with uh, installing uh, solar panels and that sort of thing very early on. And one of the biggest success was actually an organic foods company called uh, Odecram, yeah. uh, which I was a major shareholder in for about 20 years, made it did a turnaround. And so um, all of these, um, many, many, of course, of the other startups didn't survive. That's typical for venture capital. But uh, we had a pretty good percentage, actually, probably 30, 40% survived. But how, how did you, like, because you, you're also a member of the Balloton Group. So you, you've always been also in that, that more kind of sy strategic systems thinking, systems change conversation, while you had all these investments into supporting real grassroots actions. And, and the two, what I find so interesting that the, the two are very co connected. Like you, you've always thought about where's the systemic intervention where I can most serve the healing of the whole system. That's correct. That's correct. Well, I, I should tell you there's a bit of the background for that. I mean, I, many people have I've found that I'm a bit of a, an enigma to understand because I really have three different uh, hats on. Uh, one is my traditional business hat. One is my work with, with the um, NGO world, with the, like uh, eco-villages and guy education and so forth. And, but the third one is, is my spiritual hat. Mm -hmm. And I didn't say much about that. I don't often talk about that in public, but uh, the fact of the matter is that until about, I think it was 1982, I was pretty much the traditional businessman. Uh, although I did have a, an interest in, in, in a lot of, I used to th call it paranormal phenomenon or these strange stories that you hear about people who sound very authentic, who are talking about various, I would say, sort of spiritual activities like life after death and that sort of thing, near death experiences. And I'm, I'm reading all these things and I'm thinking this is really strange because I'm trained as a scientist, you know, show me the facts, you know, and yet these people, they, their stories, they sound so authentic. And so I was, I began to delve into that. And then I had a personal experience that really opened me up when I was in India. This and, is what uh, you, des you described as in the Kali Yuga, no? In yeah, the I wrote a book about yeah. it called the Kali Yuga Odyssey. And uh, so I, I had an awakening, which uh, had the effect of making it very aware to me on a personal level of the existence of the divine. You know, you, you can't convince anybody else about that unless they experience it themselves but i had that experience and many other people have had it by the way and it's always a little different how it happens but to me the, the result of that experience was that uh well first of all i spent the next 20 years trying to understand what happened and, and to understand more about it. the guy was a total novice when this happened um but um it also occurred to me that um, I have to think seriously about how I want to use the rest of my life now. I want to do it for the common good. I want to do something to help the, the planet, help our survival, because I see there are a lot of danger signals. For example, back around 1970, I began to get interested in, in um, the long-term evolution of the planet. Um, I read uh, books like Science Spring and The Closing Circle, uh, then came uh, World Dynamics by Jay Forrester, followed by Limits to Growth a year later with the more popularized version of his model. And that, um, th those kinds of studies really inspired me because, well, the Limits to Growth, for example, was right, right down my alley because that's, it, was, it was basically an operations researcher who developed that model, mm -hmm. Jay Forrester. And uh, so basically it was a question of trying to integrate these three different streams of my life, the spiritual, the NGO world and, and, and the business world. And, and so I have these different hats on, but I, I, I see them all as in a way, holistic, holistically connected, just mm -hmm. like your guy education, where we have the four dimensions. When we teach holistic thinking, we have the, uh, we have the, uh, 
the economic aspect, the social aspect, the ecological, and the what we call the worldview, which is basically the cultural, spiritual aspect. And yeah. so we, we all have, we all have these dimensions in our everyday life. So um, it's not that unusual that, that you. But a lot of people sort of focus very much on just one of these, and they don't mm -hmm. never get in touch with the others. <laughs> no, I, I think that that's the big um, the biggest contribution in terms of helping to transform narrative um is like i, I i've had this fascinating dance with um finding out about guy education through uh while i was at schumacher doing work on a very similar area but from an intellectual point of view and an interest in eco villages um that then when I first saw the early version of the mandala when in of the wheel that that has become iconic for guy education with social economic ecological design and worldview as as the the, the the four dimensions the first versions of it that before it even was published had instead of worldviews what you were just saying spiritual cultural and um I think we did the calling it worldview made it more accessible for the people who at that point and there's still people out there now get triggered by the s word by the spirituality world oh and yeah 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 especially in, in, africa, in africa you say spirituality in africa and the only thing they think of is colonialism you know yeah and so that's not a good word for them so, so but, but but by bringing it in i think also through the connections through Findhorn and through Jen with the United Nations and being an eco socket to the United Nations, bringing the fourth dimension into the UN discourse and through that into other realms, I think was a massive contribution because up until that point, everybody talked about the three-legged stool of sustainability, the social, economic, and ecological, and the awareness that it is our underlying narrative that in our worldview and our stories about who are we, how are we connected to the whole, um, what is what is success in terms of how do I manifest my own potential in service to the larger yeah. context that brings me forth, like actually yeah. understanding that it's impossible to express one's own potential without serving a larger yeah, world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, it's, so, and yeah. it's so difficult, you know, for many cultures to understand other cultures. I mean, the 20th century and up to now in the 21st century is to a great extent a phase in our civilization's development where we're beginning to meet each other uh, across the globe and learn about other cultures. Well, for many, many centuries, we had no contact with other cultures. And so it's so important, this aspect of teaching holistic thinking to make, let people understand how other cultures can be just as, just as good as ours, but they have a different way of looking at things. And what is common as I mentioned before, is is you can have the same value systems about caring for the planet, caring for each other, and you can package them in very many different ways. You know, whatever you call your religion. Um, like I remember, I I, used, I spent some time with uh, Sai Baba, uh, the Indian spiritual master, uh, a couple of times, and he uh, he has a logo where he has the five major um, religions on it. And when 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 people come to him, he says. He says, "Don't change your religion. Stick with it, but 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 learn that, that there's a common de denominator in all of these religions. I think all religions, in many ways, ha are coming from the same basic impulse. There's yeah. one, there's one, to there's one divine, but it ex expresses itself. It manifests itself differently depending on where, which culture it it, it, it arises within. But but there really all there is only as Bobby, Sai Baba says, there's only." one religion and that's the religion of love mm. very well said and and it's not just within cultures it's within each and every individual the divine manifests it's like we, we are to my mind at least expressions of that larger transforming whole that only brings itself into being through relationship and the fundamental relationship is love that keeps it all right. um, so um yeah, that's, but it's, it's precisely how do we bring these insights into the world? And it, it's rare to have a, individuals like you who, in, for so many people, trapped in the narrative of separation and 
competition and survival of the fittest, um, you have achieved what in that framing is the ultimate measure of success. You, you, you created this, um, what you call the money machine, the, 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 the software that helped Gaia build, build the fortune that Gaia, Gaia Trust then used um, strategically to be of service. And you could have got yourself a super yacht and um, become a <laughs> oligarch type, um, but, but you chose not to. And, and for, for me, that is the kind, kind of example that um, we need a lot more of. Like, it, it, what, what is your attitude towards people like Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos, uh, Bezos or Elon Musk who pretend to be serving, but actually, I mean, if you look at what they're doing is they're, they're just st strategically, philanthropically investing in things that they then make economic profit of in a, in a different way. Um, what would you say to people who have achieved a lot of wealth, how to steward or how to responsibly work with that? Because I think your life has been an example of, of, of having done that. Well, it's a, I, I think um, people like you, the ones you're mentioning are to a great extent a product of, 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 of the economic system which we have developed over the last 40 years. <laughs> You, where you get extreme, extreme wealth in a few individuals and, and, a, and a large group of what I would call working poor. Um, I'm, I, right, one of the projects I'm working on right now is I'm, I'm working on a, uh, some ref recommendations as how we can reform the economic system. And it's, I'm, it's based on, I'm developing a, um, a top-down uh, dynamic computer model based on a very uh, complex systems, like, so a bit like limits to growth in a way, using uh, a few equations, but with, which, which uh, demonstrate the really vital and, and important parameters in our society. And, um, and, and it, this will also include some, st some examples of, of how our economic system is totally misunderstood, even by economists and by politicians. There's so many misunderstandings about how it works. So I'm, I'm trying to use my models to show the correct way of understanding the economic system and how we can modify it in order to make it a more, um, more equal society. We're never going to have a totally equal society, but it can be much much more equal than it is today. And one of the major reasons for the great dissatisfaction we have around the whole world is because inequality has gotten off, off the charts. It's gotten so bad that you have cases like, as you say, where you have a th or two or three individuals who have as much wealth as half the population. I mean, that's, that's, that's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's just, one of the problems is that the, uh, particularly in the United States, the, the, you, I call them the oligarchs actually in my book. And it is an oligarchy in the U.S. It's not. It's no longer a democracy. I think many people have made this point. Um, and um, they um, basically have purchased the political system over the last 30, 40 years, and the and the and the courts. They they have influenced so much influence now that that um, the, the whole system is 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 designed to make them more wealthy, even though they have so much wealth already. Hmm. And that has to change. That it, it's 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 going to have to change. How do you, because, because you've always been in technology, um, so you're definitely not an anti-technology person, um, but, but this, no. this oligarchy is very closely linked to also, like, um, no, I'm specific, what, what was it? what's the name of the Greek um, former fa uh, finance minister? Um, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. He, um, yeah, I'm spacing on his name right now, but but he calls them the techno oligarchy, uh, or, the, or the the current system that we have. He calls a techno oligarchy, and, yeah. and he criticizes that 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 somehow there is an IT dimension to making that system possible. I mean, if you just look at um, how Bezos made his his money, and and how do we? How in, in this shift from this obscene level of inequality, how do we also make sure that we harness the, the way we use um, these technologies in a way that they actually support local and regional structures rather than ever more globalizing structures? 
Yes, well, I, I think we have to have a lot more public control of technologies. I know that a lot of people in the private business world, they say, oh, you, you can't pick the winners sort of thing. We have to leave it up to the private capitalism to find the best solutions. But um, it, it, it turns out that, that that's not the case. They, they often find solutions which are very detrimental to the planet as a whole. They're environmentally disastrous and so forth. And so I, I think we have to develop a system where there's much more uh, public activity in the business world, and one of the one of the things that I'm recommending in in my book uh, is is the idea of having more public banking. So that the, the, you know, in the in the current economic system, we have two major economies. We have the, what I would call the real economy, and we have a speculative economy. And uh, unfortunately, the speculative economy today is far greater than than the real economy. And uh, so what, what we have to do is we have to separate these into two parts. And the one, the part that is the real economy is where the public has interest is involved. And, and this is where the government has to step in, I think, and, and uh, have a, a much, much greater say as to what sort of technologies they're going to support. They could do this, for example, by um, through interest rates, for example, the, the, the government together with the central bank basically is able to establish the level of interest rates and by if they have a public bank for example which is lending directly to businesses then they're able to take into account whether the type of businesses that we want to encourage or to discourage a, a, a way of if you might you know, like say putting a, a price tag on uh, externalities so if you have a, 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 an industry which you want to promote you give them a lower industry if you want to, uh, to penalize them because they have too much let's say negative technology or too much carbon dioxide emissions, you give them a, high, a higher interest rate. In this way, the, the public can become much more active in, in planning the development of the economy, but still within the market system, it's still a capitalist system. I'm not opposed to capitalism because there are many um, innovative ideas which come out of the, the, the free market, which, which we don't want to destroy. But we've gotten so far away from um, the, the original idea of, of a government is, is basically to protect its citizens. And protecting, protecting citizens is not just a question of military protection. It's a question of protecting them against exploitation also. Hmm. And right now, in most countries are being exploited by their elites. You know, they're, 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 I mean, the idea, 60% of Americans have no, no wealth at all. They, they're living from paycheck to paycheck. I call them the working poor in my model, because that's what they are. And it's the same in many countries. Yeah, definitely here in Spain, it's quite common uh, that people work from paycheck to paycheck. But in how do you see the role of um, different models of ownership and also different models of enterprise? I had a very fascinating conversation with, with a, a German regenerative space activist who um, has just gone through the, the, the hard work of Within the German system, in order to get to launch a new cooperative, you have to um, be get get the get the stamp of a Dachverband, a bigger union of cooperatives, and and it took him quite a long time to register this new legal form, which is called a regenerative cooperative, and the the idea there is to create a legal vehicle where people within a regional context can invest um, in local food, water, and energy sovereignty, the infrastructure for that, um, renewable energy, um, local agroforestry, all, the, all those things, um, and become a share owner of that system. And I, th I think it, it and, and he made one very critical point. He said that the reason why he put so much effort into all of this is that he, in order to have an agent that is actually still in the economy that is the money economy, not the philanthropy economy or the NGO economy, because the minute you, you set up intervention bodies that are more association foundations, NGOs, they're, they're in a different space than the economic space. The cooperative is in that space. Like cooperative business models are growing faster than any other model at the moment. And at the same time, there are lots of experiments with land owning intergenerational trusts where, where people want to create the option of transferring land back to a global commons 
under the conditions of a certain rule of custodianship for that land. Do you think that those those, those models are a part of making these real economies healthier again? And, yeah, and I, 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 I very much support the idea of a greater um, degree number of, of worker owned uh, corporations. Um, I think it creates a, a much more satisfying environment uh, for, for, for the working people. Um, and also this this relatively new form of organization called uh, Teal. Are you familiar with that? Uh, it was developed by uh, mm -hmm. Frederick Ledoux in his book called uh, Re Reinventing Organization. Mm -hmm. And the, the idea basically in Teal is, is to de delegate as much as possible to various working groups who are, cl who are close you know, to the, your suppliers and close to your customers. And so that the, the chief executive is more of a an ins inspirer and a coordinator than a top-down uh, dictator. You know, like mm -hmm. in many companies, which are hierarchical built up, and, and the orders come from above, and the people in the middle and lower echelons are just basically taking orders, and they don't have a lot of ability to. But it's often the people in the middle and lower echelons of a big company that, that know best, you know, what's needed uh, in in the marketplace, and um, this is totally consistent with the idea of having a, a greater degree of worker ownership. Also, so I think that's the way we're going uh, in, the, in in the future, more in that direction. Um, it fits very well in with with my idea as about reforming the economic system also so that uh, we have a a greater spread of, of wealth uh, and not have it so concentrated and I, I just would love to go back to one one piece because i think it's it's an important piece of history of systemic intervention that, that not enough people are aware of um when was how many, about three or four years ago, Gaia Trust celebrated um, its, well, how many years? 20, was it 25 or 30? Oh, it's, it's 30, from, from 1987, yeah. yeah. And, and I was, I mean, there were some figures in, in that report that I, I always felt we, we missed an opportunity there because on the one hand, it's, it's staggering. Is it roughly two and a half million to... Global Eco Village Network and two and a half million to Guy Education is what I have in in my mind that Guy Trust has donated over of the existence of that of those organizations. Is that oh, it's probably much more than that. Yeah, uh, but 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 I still felt that, that we we only spoke and this this is about systemic strategic investment. We only spoke about the cash that was invested, like the money, but the kind of networks that that money enabled had so many people that, that I know working really like with passion on trying to do something with, with those funds that I feel like that, that there's been a sort of sweat equity, like a, a match funding in terms of energy that, that the impact, like in terms of leveraging, um, mm, it leveraged true. much more than that in terms of money because so many people got inspired by by building this network and and, and put much yeah, more you, yeah. one of the one of the things that we decided very early on is we wanted to we wanted to support people who were not able to get support elsewhere mm -hmm. and it's very typical for many uh, smaller projects that, that you know the the big money the big foundations and the government money they, they, they ignore them because they're too small which is understandable in a way because there's so much administration involved so we we developed a strategy of, of just giving grants where we thought it was a, dec a decent looking project and not asking them for budgets, not asking them for following them up with controls and so forth. It reminds me of a story once that one of the former uh, directors of the Ford Foundation, when he retired, he said one of the things he regrets is that they use so much of their resources just on administration. He said roughly one third of the, t of the total every year was on administration. He said somehow, sometimes he wonders whether we might have been better off just to give it Look at the random people in the phone book. <laughs> <laughs> I might have gotten more out of it. It's true. Like I, I had this experience that, um, you know, I, I was on the jury of the Lush Spring Prize for three years, and in in the process, there was a lot of, it was a wonderful process. But all the judges that came together, having to give away two hundred fifty thousand to eleven projects out of. The, the runner ups, the, the, the finalists, which were maybe 50 projects around the world, we always felt that at least 
48, 49 of those 50 projects would have deserved money. And it was really hard to choose. And then I realized that, that the front end of some of these giveaway competitions is often about matching the back end, meaning the whole cost of the process of then um, announcing the prize, running the prize, managing the prize, managing the, the judges, bringing the winners to a location to celebrate the prize. A lot of money spent on that. And, and so I, I started to weave together the Lush Spring Prize with the Buckminster Fuller Institute, who were also running a, a prize and had in order to give more value to these small projects that have invested lots of energy to win a prize, but then only get a nice letter saying, wonderful project, the judges loved it, but sorry, no cigar, um, you, you didn't quite make the prize. And, and to build a platform that would showcase these vetted projects that have already gone through a pre-selection process, then a final selection process with international judges that, that, that know something about that thing, and showcase these two foundations that um, get to the end of the financial year and say, oh, we've, we haven't get, given away these 50, 50 grand, and if we don't give it away this year, we, we won't have the next year, so it, that, that, because it actually happens. And, yeah. and out of that grew something that is now housed in the Buckminster Fuller Institute, which is called regenerosity.world is the website. And, and because it, it addressed, like, as we were working on this together with, with Amanda Radenhill from Buckminster Fuller Institute and Ruth uh, Andrade from Lush, Lush um, what emerged is this systemic dysfunctionality of the funding mechanism, which is what you were just addressing. People who, let's say, they want to give away 5 million a year, in the good intention of not wanting to have large overheads by giving away 5 million to 100 projects, it, they say, let's, let's make it easier. Let's find five really good projects and give them a million each. And that's very often not funding the right projects, or if it's funding the right projects, giving them a million results in, oh yeah, we've always needed a new pickup truck and five new computers and um, like investments that are of a different type than, than going to, a hundred projects and saying we're going to give you fifty grand over ten years every year. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. You know, in my experience has been that I, I over the last many years, a lot have been approached by many, many people who would like to get some maybe ten, twenty million upfront for their. Yeah, they have this fantastic vision of a project, yeah. and 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 my experience is that the, those kinds of projects almost always fail. Yeah. The ones that succeed. And the ones that I like to support are the ones, people who started up very small. They started up very small and they got, they got it to work. They had a success on a small project. And those are the kind of people I'd like to give some more money to help them grow, mm. but grow organically, not gotten, getting a lot of money up front. Mm. That's the best way to grow. Mm. And that's, as you say, it's the same, pro, the, the, the error that the, a lot of these foundations make is, is forgetting these small projects. Actually, many of the foundations, particularly in the US, I know have uh, have tried to solve this by giving away some of their money uh, by different criteria than the big money. They call mm -hmm. them mad, mad money. Mm -hmm. but, sort of the sort of thing that we did, you know, mad money, where you don't have the same uh, sort of demands on, on, on budgets and controls and so forth. But you say, okay, this sounds interesting. We're not going to spend a lot of administration on this. Go ahead, see what you can do with it. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in what, because I, I mean, I, I talked to some people who used to work with large, like philanthropic foundations that have been around for, for many decades or, and longer. And um, for them, sometimes, like the actual board of directors doesn't even look at projects that are less than 500,000. Mm. Um, that, that, that becomes a sort of, item in the board of director meetings that takes five mi minutes and says each regional director has these 10 projects of 500 grand and um, they just either wave it through or not. And it often depends on what other big projects are on the table, how much money is left over for, for that kind of giving. And it, it, feel, it still feels dysfunctional and, uh, but because actually it's, it's the nitty gritty. And this is what, 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 what regenerosity.world is trying to do to actually give to these 
projects that are needing 10 grand, 20 grand, 50 grand, um, which is really tiny for the large philanthropic organizations. But, but it's, yeah, I, 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 I hear that in these organizations, there is what they would call mad money, but, but it's actually still really large sums of money going to relatively large organizations. Um, so after all this experience of, of doing systemic change work, where, where do you feel has you, what are you most proud of in terms of the, 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 the things that you helped birth? Because you, there's so much that you, you've done. Oh, I don't think of it quite in those terms. Um, it's, I think it's very hard to say. Let me, um, let, let, me, let me reframe it. If you, it's, it's more the kind of exercise of saying, if this is it, what are the things that, that filled my life with really deep meaning of where I put the energy? Proud is a bit of a strange term. Um, like what? Well, as I say, one of the original motivations of the uh, uh, Eco Village movement back in the 90, 1990 or so was the idea that the Eco Village movement could uh, play an important role in, in, in shifting civilization towards a more, more caring, more love oriented society in the longer run. And, and uh, we originally said that this is a long term project, this is a 40 year minimum, 40 year project. I remember I was at Fintorn once and one of the speakers said, no, no project is worth starting if it doesn't take at least 40 years. <laughs> and that inspired me a bit. I thought, yeah, well, that's, that's all that's, from Featherstone. <laughs> so, we, so we still got another eight years to run uh, from that original 40 years. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, um, I won't be around when, when, we, when the final history is written, but I, I certainly hope that if, if, we're, if, the, if the Ecovage movement is able to be a, a fundamental um, force in, 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 or part of that force, at least it's, it's creating this necessary change, then I'll be very happy uh, that I put my energies in the right place. Mm -hmm. But who knows, so many things can happen. The, the future is so hard to predict, but yes. we have to, the best thing we can do is, is lay the groundwork and hope, hope for the best. And, and maybe as a final thing, um, with regard to these two, like the, I've been involved with the Global Ecoverge Network from before Gaia Education being born. And then I got involved with Gaia Education relatively early on um, when the very first uh, EDE training of trainers was run at, at Findhorn in 2006. I, I was one of the, the, the people on the course. And then 2007 joined the Geese and we met in, in Monks and at Ashram at, at the um, get, gathering of the Geese. I remember. And so so I, I've, I, like just recently, Jane Rasbash was here last weekend because she was on Mallorca for a guy education project and, and, and stayed with us for a couple of days. And we, we sp spoke about how much institutional awareness, even her and I, after 20 years with these organizations, 15 years with these organizations have, that is now not necessarily in everybody who's currently running the organizations. And, and there's this story that at, at a time it was useful to spin guy education a little bit further away from the global eco-village network in order to reach other audiences. And they've both defined slightly different audiences and an attention from like they're, in a strange way of naming it, they're different brands and different ways of working. But now there seems to be a need in the next evolutionary stage to bring them back together again a bit more in order to not have to reinvent the wheel within of, of courses that actually Guy Education holds within the Global Ecovillage Network and so on. What's your vision of how could we how could we heal the this slight discord between those organizations because they're they're, they're sister organizations they were both funded by you and, and and they're serving a meaningful transformation in the world. Well, actually, it's, we had a, a, a very relevant discussion this last month actually between Jen and Guy Education about um, the future. And we discussed various alternatives, whether we should actually have a merger or whether we should continue as separate organizations, but, but have a closer collaboration. 
And um, the, the, the result of those, that dialogue was that we decided that uh, least Gen in particular was not really organizationally ready uh, for a merger, but um, both both organizations are we're, we're positively interested in having a, a better form of collaboration, mm -hmm. and we're now discussing very practical ways in which we can achieve this. Mm -hmm. So that for the time being, it looks like that's the way it will evolve. Sounds wise to me. In the long run, perhaps uh, they they may merge into a single organization. Um, actually, we are at a point now where the guy trust money is running out. It was always intended that way that it would run out after 30 or 40, 35 years. So um, the last, after another one to two years, um, they will be totally on their own yeah. as far as guy trust is concerned. And I hope that both will be able to survive. I think they both have a good, good chance of that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a conversation we should should maybe have between the two of us also a little bit about um, how we can nurture that because I think it's so important that um, like I, I see a lot of new educational outfits fitting uh, setting up trying to offer to a now much larger demand than ever the kind of content that is already in the courses that both Gen and Guy Education are holding. And it's really important to either collaborate with it, like, the, like, like to somehow find a way that the wealth of material that is in these organizations doesn't disappear should one of those two organizations not make it after it doesn't have core funding anymore. Because um, there's so much blood, sweat, and tears and so much effort that went into making all this uh, like creating this content that to really be transformative and impact, it needs to be available to, to people. And that's, that's, that's where I'm, I'm wondering how may, maybe radical collaboration with other organizations um, is the way forward uh, in order to even increase the reach. But, but let's, let's schedule another conversation to, to talk to strategy about that. But this, this has sure. been wonderful and really appreciate. I'll, I'll just, Stop the recording and then we can say goodbye. Thanks. Thanks so much. Hold on. Um, My pleasure.